everybody. God bless you all. Hope that everybody is having themselves a blessed Sunday today. Before we get started in our topic today, I just want to read a psalm to you all. So we're going to read from Psalm, we can read together, Psalm chapter 27. And the heading for the psalm is an exuberant declaration of faith, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat my flesh up, to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, and in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my, en above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face. My heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not, do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsook me, then, when my father and, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witness have risen against me, and such as, and such as breathe out violence, and, and such as uh, breathe out violence, I have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. That is the uh, psalm that I wanted to start the stream off today with. Uh, today, though, our topic is going to be on the Quran and whether or not early Muslims believed in word-for-word -word preservation. And before we get into that, before we, before we get into that um, topic, what I want to do is I want to introduce a story which you may be familiar with, but if you're not, that's why I want to share it. It's to do with a scribe that Muhammad had who would write down his uh, dictations for him whenever he would say he's getting revelation. The scribe would write things down for him. This was one of his scribes. And there were some instances when Muhammad would say something and the scribe would write something else and Muhammad would hear it when the scribe read it back to him and he said yeah it's the same thing they have the same meaning this caused doubt for the scribe and the scribe left Islam and this scribe did return to Islam after well we'll get into the story we'll get into the story actually now I just want to kind of give a brief intro to that, um, I think I think uh, bef uh, actually, let me just pull up the screen here so we can see. Oh yeah, so so much of the information, much of the information today, much of the information today will be coming from this book called "The One and the Many: The Early History of the Quran" by Francois de Roche and translated. Uh, tra so he's writing in French and it's translated from the French by Malcolm. Okay, so this is a really great book covering the history of the Quran, the uh, 
the the compilation, how it has been preserved through history, different forms, different different leadership, all, all sorts of different things throughout the history of the Quran, canonization, manuscripts, all of that. So much of the information today is going to be coming from this book or material that I learned from this book. And if you guys haven't noticed by now, this is something that I really enjoy doing is when I learn something new, I like to share it with you all. So hopefully it will help aid you in your ministries to Muslims. Or if you're a Muslim watching, I hope that this is going to open your eyes to see that you cannot trust the standard narrative. You can't trust Islam. You can't trust Muhammad. And the ultimate goal, our prayer in all of this, is that you, the Muslim, would come to the Lord Jesus. Now, this book contains much great information, and we're going to begin with a verse in the Quran in chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 93. 6, verse 93. And this is, I won't read the entirety of the verse, but it, we're going to just get started on the verse, and then... When it gets to the main point of our focus, we're going to go to the commentaries and explain why this verse was quote-unquote revealed. So it says, For who is more unjust than someone who fabricated lies against Allah, or said, It was revealed to me, when nothing had been revealed to him? And someone who said, I will send down the like of what Allah has sent down. And if only you could see the unjust ones in their perplexities of death as the angels stretch their hands get yourselves out today you are being repaid with the punishment of shame on the account of what you used to say about Allah over then the truth etc etc now you might be curious what is the Quran talking about here who is the Quran referring to when it says who is more unjust than someone who fabricated lies against Allah or said it was revealed to me when nothing had been revealed to him and someone who said I will send down the like of what Allah has sent down who do you think that this is referring to the Quran as has been proven time and time again by many Christian brothers and sisters apologists and people who uh, expose Islam that the Quran does not explain itself, although it claims to be a perfectly described and detailed book, we have to go to the commentaries. And one of the commentaries we have here by uh, by, At by At Tabari, he gives us a comment on this verse. Now I'm just showing the Arabic briefly in passing for those who speak Arabic, those who want references in Arabic, and uh, you know people who want to challenge translations or anything like that. Here's the reference. You guys who want this can pause, screenshot, whatever you want to do. There is an English translation of not just this account. This account is one version. And we're going to kind of notice that this is a theme in Islamic text, Islamic literature, that there are multiple accounts of many different things that happen. And sometimes you'll see like little details changing here and there. You'll see characters changing. Um, and really, it's it's kind of getting to the same point, but sometimes some of the dip, sometimes some of the details differ. So this is not unique to this story, but this is just one particular account of what happened. Now, if we go to a um, a Muslim scholar by the name of Yasin Dutton, in one of his works, he details this hadith, this hadith, this event, and he also mentions other ones that are related. To this, so other stories, as I mentioned, you'll find it in, in a couple different versions. So he mentions, as I said, that Al Tabari is one of the people who records this story, and one of the companions, one of the scribes of Muhammad Abdullah bin Sa'id ibn Abi Sarh. Uh, well, it gives you like his entire, you know, for those who are, who are interested, he has his entire name again. If you guys want a screenshot, uh, actually, you know, I, I will read through this actually, just because this is actually kind of important to get us started on our topic today um so where was i okay so yeah usually usually known as um abdullah bin abi sarh or just simply put ibn abi sarh okay it says he was one of the scribes who would write down verses of the revelation but that he apostatized when a change which he himself had inadvertently made to the end of a verse 
was confirmed by the prophet, which led him to doubt the divine nature of revelation. So back to the Quran here. What is the Quran talking about? It says, um, someone who said, I will send down the like of what Allah had sent down. So who is the Quran responding to? The Quran is responding to Ibn Abi Sarh, the scribe of Muhammad. And it gets into the detail now. He says, one version says that the Prophet had dictated Azizun Hakim, mighty and wise, and Abi, uh, Ibn Abi Sarh wrote down Gharfurun. So, so he's writing that. So Muhammad is dictating something to him, and he's writing down something different. So he's writing down Gharfurun uh, Rahim, forgiving and merciful. Uh, I guess I'll just stick with the English just for the audience's sake. Um, so, so, so Muhammad would would say the mighty and the wise, and the scribe would write down forgiving and merciful instead. Right? So Muhammad is saying this and he writes down something else. And then he would read out to the Prophet what he had written to the false prophet, but this is a Muslim writing. But actually many people in and who read on this topic on an academic level they'll just say the Prophet. Um so if I slip up and forget to say the false prophet, uh I'm just, forgive me. Uh, of course I believe he's a false prophet. Anyway, uh so then he read up to the false prophet what he had written down, and the false prophet said, Yes, they are the same. So Muhammad would say, mighty and wise, and the scribe would write down, forgiving and merciful. And so then the scribe, uh, Ibn Abi Sarh, would say, forgiving and merciful, although Muhammad said, mighty and wise. And Muhammad would say, yeah, they're the same. And then there's, there are other versions that mention that the false prophet would dictate, and to Allah is forgiving and, and, and sorry and Allah is forgiving and merciful so and Allah is forgiving and merciful and then the scribe Ibn Abi Sarh changed it to and Allah is all hearing and all knowing so instead of forgiving and merciful as Muhammad said he would write down all hearing all knowing at which point the false prophet said it's the same either way it's the same either way now, there's much to say about this. I'll just make a brief point here that Muhammad is saying it doesn't matter which names you use. You can say it this way or you can say it that way. It's the same either way. So the question today is, did the early Muslims believe in word-for-word -word preservation or did they believe that you could just substitute words of the Quran like the scribe is doing here? Continuing on, um, or that the false prophet dictated high and wise and the scribe would, I'm just going to say the scribe even though you guys can see his name here, just for repetition and saying it over and over again, I'll just say the scribe, Ibn Abi Sarh. Um, uh, uh, he, he asked him, all-knowing and wise. So instead of saying high and wise, he would say all-knowing and wise. And the, and, and the false prophet said, yes, both are correct. So in other words, it doesn't matter if you say he's he's, it doesn't matter if you say he's high or all-knowing, they're all the same. Um, it doesn't matter, it, it, it's the same thing. Now, uh, another, it goes on and it says, or when the, pro or when the false prophet would say, um, this again, again, you know, the all-knowing and uh, all-wise, Alim um, al-Hakim, and then, it's, then Ibn Abi Sarh would write down some, then he would write down the all hearing and all knowing. Okay. As a result of the seeming confirmation of his own words being the words of revelation, in other words, this, this scribe is saying, what is Muhammad doing? Every time he says something, I'm changing his words. And when I change his words and read them back to him, he's saying, yeah, that's how it was sent down. Or yeah, that's the same meaning. So this caused him to doubt, and he goes. So this is this is Yasin Dutton, a Muslim, a Muslim scholar, modern Muslim scholar, writing the writing this account down. And he goes on. Uh, Dutton c continues, and he says, "We are told was overwhelmed by doubt, arguing that if his own words were being accepted as divine revelation in this instance, how could he trust the rest of the revelation was truly divine of divine origin?" So. If this scribe, he's kind of reasoning amongst him, he's reasoning in himself and he's saying, look, if I can just change these words and Muhammad is accepting them, how can I trust anything else he's saying, right? 
that that's that's so this is a lot there's a lot of directions you, we can take this but i have a particular focus today although i'm sure you guys can imagine we can you know think of many many different ways to use this story and uh as a way to get through to the muslims and their standard narrative and um show them that islam is false through this but we have one particular focus today that i want to stay on and so it continues on and it says, uh, you know, there's another there's another version of this where the where and this this might be the one that that people are most familiar with, where the scribe would uh, so fatabarakal. So this is the one where he's saying like, blessed is you know, blessed is Allah, the best of all creators, um, at the end of the verse and uh, chapter twenty three, verse fourteen, and it said. So there's another there's another version of the story where that's the verse that kind of gave him doubt because he would say those words and it says on the occasion of his doubt and that that's why he apostatized that's why he left Islam. So then then he then Dutton mentions although this addition was also attributed to Omar as well. So Omar as well had this addition so there's there's another version of this story where it's not um Ibn Abi Sarh who says this but it's Omar who says this. And uh, that's so he's just kind of clarifying that there's two different accounts of this one with Omar, one with the scribe. Okay. Now, again, our focus today is can we prove that the early Muslims did not believe this? Is what I really want to focus on today did, that they did not believe in early. The early Muslims, did they? can we prove that they did not believe in word-for-word -word preservation? Can we prove that they did not believe that? And instead, they believed in something much like what the scribe did, where he would substitute words or take phrases. or We're going to see that it kind of opens up into different areas. Now, I have a video here that we can... Let's see, share screen. We can get into. And... I'm going to start us out with this with this video and I'm going to show you I believe that we're going to be starting with a sheikh by the name of Imran Hussein and he's going to talk to us about two verses in the Quran however he's going to be explaining a particular detail about how the Quran was written and the script that the Quran was written in with diacritical marks and vowels, and we'll get into it. So let me play the clip here, and we'll see what he says. They would either speak to mankind or damage mankind. The Arabic text can be read two ways. If it's being, if it's being spoken, of course, we know exactly what it is. But when it's not spoken and it's written, then they put in these diacritical marks, Fatan, Kesra, and Dhamma. And you can change it around because this didn't come from Allah. This is human beings. So they wrote it, the Dabatul Ad to Kalimuhum would speak to mankind. And I said, I want to take that with a pinch of salt. Because I still have a mind with which to think. Speaking to mankind? The other one is taklimuhum, would un injure you, and damage you. I said, that makes more sense to me. So I have departed from this <laughs> the overwhelming majority of the scholars of Islam and the Muslims accept that one. So they will have to solve their problem. I can't solve it for them. But because I accept that the Quran is saying that the Dabatul Al will damage you, this one makes a lot of sense. Similar with the one that I began, that the sign of all signs of the last day, wa innahu la alamun lisa'a. But they say no. Wa innahu la ilmun lisa'a. He is the knowledge of the hour. 
I say, you got trouble. When you say that Jesus, alayhi salam, is the knowledge of the hour, and Allah says, no, the knowledge of the hour is only with me. So this one is transparently, transparently false. That every single copy of the Quran you pick up today, they have put in. And he is the knowledge of the hour, when it should be. He is a sign of all signs of the hour. I've given you two instances where it's not the Quran which has been changed. Don't you make that mistake of saying that Imran has said someone changed the Quran because you should be, you should be thrown into a garbage bin for speaking such a falsehood about me. It's not the Quran which has changed. It is the diacritical marks, the Fatha and the Kesra and the Dhamma, which were not there in the time of the Prophet. There was no Fatha and Kesra and Dhamma. It is when non Arabs entered in the Ummah to help us to read the Quran, the Putin, the Fatha and Kesra. So, who put it in? The human beings put it in. And human beings can do good things and can also do bad things. Okay. Now, I don't know if you guys caught all of that. I, I, I'm not wanting to pause. Every time I get excited to pause, I'm trying to let the videos play out more. <laughs> so hopefully it's helpful that way so you guys can catch everything that they're saying. But if not, I just want to clarify what exactly he just said. What he's saying is that the way that the Quran is written originally without the diacritical marks so without like the a vowel the e vowel the o vowel and these marks were added in later on and so he's saying you can read the quran in the way to where it means like for example speaking or to cause damage and, or you can read the quran in the other verse when it has to do with jesus and is is he the is he the sign or is he the knowledge of the last hour and he's saying look without the diacritical marks you can really read it either way and so that that's what that's kind of exactly what i'm wanting to get at today of this point about the freedom the liberty that the early muslims had when it came to reading the quran in which in in, in whatever way they for example in this instance we're just talking about diacritical marks so if it fits with this word they use that word if it fits with the other word they use that word that's really what i want to focus on and so this is just kind of a, a, an example with diacritical marks in the two instances that he gave although if we actually go to the verses that he gave we'll see that it's not just diacritical marks there are other times uh for example in the in the verse about being the sign or the hour there's an instance where it takes away the definite article, so there actually is a change in the consonants there, not just the diacritical marks. However, the point still stands. The question is, did Muslims have this freedom to just read it either way? He's saying the way that it's written today in the Quran, the way that the diacritical marks have it today, he's saying it's it's patently false. It's 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 demonstrably false. It's 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 incredibly uh, misguided and and whatever other language he used. So, with that being said, we'll continue on and we're going to listen to Shabir Ali. He's going to be talking about whether or not early Muslims, whether or not early Muslims paid closer attention to preserving the Quran word for word. Is that what they focused on? Or did they focus on preserving the Quran according to its meaning? So, did they, did they want to, did they, did they have the mindset that Muslims have today where say Muhammad says something and they so the idea that you get today from Muslims is that you know Muhammad says something and that people learn word for word exactly how he said it exactly how he said it is that the mindset of the early Muslims let's listen to Shabir Ali and then we'll get into the source material and we'll see is Shabir telling us the truth here or not because I sh I'm sure that Muslims will just throw him under the bus like they normally do They'll throw him under the bus and say, look, he, he, yes, he's a Muslim, yes, he's a scholar, but we don't accept everything he says. So we're going to introduce the topic through him, but we are going to get into the early sources as well to see if what he's saying is true or not. So again, the question is, 
were Muslims concerned with preserving the Quran word for word or were they concerned with preserving it in another way? In our present situation, we lay a great emphasis on preserving the Quran letter for letter, word for word, because we want to make sure that nobody's going to change it. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace, the most important impetus was to ensure that the message of the Quran uh, would be absorbed and put into practice and taught to others. So the precise words, which, which are the vehicles, uh, through which the, the important teachings are being disseminated were not so important. The teachings were important, but the precise words to preserve them uh, were, not, were not of paramount importance. They did not trump the, the, in importance uh, the need for the message of the Quran to be absorbed, uh, to be practiced, and to be taught by others. And in fact, if the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, had insisted on his followers that they should pay uh, due uh, importance to the wording of the Quran to get every letter and sound correctly, uh, then that may have detracted from uh, the focus on getting the message across and implementing that in the lives of the of new Muslims. So with all of the challenges that the community faced in that early phase, it was important for uh, the uh, Muslims to focus on the meaning and the message and to circulate that. So one Muslim would go tell another one, look, uh, we got a new teaching in the form of the Quran. And the other one is asking, what does the Quran say? And then he repeats the saying and the teaching of the Quran uh, without necessarily uh, getting precisely the same words in which they were first delivered by the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace. So there was this period in which uh, Muslims had the opportunity to teach others the Quran uh, without insisting on the precise word. All right. Is Shabir correct? Is he right? Is he correct that the early emphasis from Muslims was not on word for word preservation? But instead, they were interested in preserving the Quran by another means, perhaps according to the general message, according to the general, let's say if it's command giving, it, it, is it just approximating what the command is? It's not necessarily teaching word for word as Muslims would have us believe today. Muslims today believe that it's dictated like like syllable for syllable, syllable, every the way that Muhammad would pronounce it down to Every single punctuation is exactly how he taught it to his companions, and that's exactly how it's been taught through the generations, and that's exactly how Muslims recite the Quran today. Is that is that true, or is what Shabir said true? Let's get into the sources. I'm sure that you guys are all familiar with the hadith about the seven ahruf, which is popularly translated as modes, not dialects, but we'll get into that right now. Uh, we're going to come back to this screen here, and here's a website. This is a Salafi website, Muslim website, Salafi website, called islamqa.info, and in fact, I'll post the link in the chat for you all here. Uh, if you guys want to read along or you guys want to save it, whatever you want to do with this information, Okay, there is a part of this article where they're getting into what are the seven ahruf. And this part deals with the claim that the ahruf were dialects. And what the author says here is that this is far-fetched. The idea that the ahruf, the seven ahruf were seven different dialects is far-fetched because of the hadith. And he goes into the hadith. And by the way, as I mentioned before, this, this hadith is one of those things like many, many other stories in the Quran that have many different versions. So you'll have characters being changed. Instead of Omar, you have Ubay. Instead of the, this person, you have this person. Instead of this particular detail, it'll be this detail. Instead of So you'll get different different ideas from, from different versions. But generally speaking, you get the same, you get this, it's the same uh, information um, that's being presented. And, and so kind of, that kind of is, is, is what I'm saying uh, as well about the early Quran, just like how Muslims have 
multiple versions of this story in their hadith collection like they switch up the narrative a little bit they'll say instead of Omar instead of Hisham they'll say it's like Ubay and someone else I, I'm suggesting that that's exactly how Muslims preserve the Quran as well just like how they preserve these stories with multiple versions I'm suggesting that that's how the Quran was preserved as well and when I say preserved I don't mean letter for letter word for word I'm, I'm saying that that wasn't the emphasis of the early Muslims but in their mind, they thought they were preserving it by just giving similar meanings. And then eventually there was a point in history where that was disputed and then this certain kind of orthodoxy was spread and enforced on people to the point where people were threatened if they were to read other Qurans or they were threatened or they were imprisoned or they were uh, beaten or whipped if they read other versions that weren't sanctioned by the current Muslim governments. So here is the hadith. It goes and it says it goes on and it says, I heard Hisham bin Hakim resetting Surat al Furqan in a manner different from that which I used to recite. So this is Omar saying this. He's saying that he heard Hisham reciting Hisham was reciting this chapter in a way which is different than the way he used to recite. And then it goes and it says in which the false messenger of Allah taught me to recite it. I was about to argue with him whilst he was praying, but I wanted, but I, excuse me, but I waited until he finished his prayer. So he wanted to interrupt him. He wanted to just grab him, but he said he just waited till he finished his prayer. And then I tied his gar, <laughs> and then I tied his garment around his neck. Oh my. He tied his garment around his neck and he seized him, he seized him by it and brought him to Muhammad <clears throat> and said, Oh, messenger of Allah. I heard this man reciting Surah al Furqan in a way different to the way you taught it to me. The Messenger of Allah said to him, Recite it. So he has Omar recite it, and he recited it. Uh, sorry, he's telling me Hisham recite it, and then he recited it as I heard him recite it. And then Muhammad said to, uh, said to them, It was revealed like this. And then he said to Omar, Recite it. So then Omar recited it, and he said, It was revealed like this. <laughs> So Omar, here's Hisham reciting this chapter in a way that was different than he learned. Then he brings him to Muhammad very fiercely, very violently, by the neck, grabbing him, by tying him up. And Muhammad says, I taught it this way, and I taught it this way. These are both correct. <laughs> then he goes on, he says that the Quran has been revealed in seven different ways. So this is the Ahruf, seven different ways. So recite it in the way that is easiest for you. And then they give the references here in a Bukhari and Muslim. Then the author here in Islam Q&A comments and they say that Hisham and Omar are both from the Qurayshi tribe. They're both from the Qurayshi tribe. And because both of them were from Quraysh, we know that Quraysh only had one dialect. So this kind of this kind of disputes this this is serves as a defeater for the claim that the Ahruf have anything to do with different dialects. These guys are both from the same tribe. This particular tribe speaks the same dialect, one dialect. So the differences in Ahruf cannot be due purely to dialects because they're from the same tribe. So they speak the same dialect. Now that's not our focus today. Our focus today is on this hadith of the seven Ahruf. Now, if we focus in on this particular story, I'm going to give you another version given to us by Yasir Qadi. And in this version of the story, in this version of the hadith, it's not with Omar, not with not with Omar, instead it's with Ubay. And there are details that differ a little bit, but I want you to pay attention to them because they serve uh, they serve an importance in other versions and other emphasis other things that we want to emphasize on so here we go let's listen to Yasser Qadi give another version of this as for the issue itself every single student of knowledge knows who studies ulum al quran that the mm -hmm. most difficult topics are ahruf and qiraat and the concept of ahruf and the reality of ahruf and the relationship of the Rahmanic Mus'haf with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the Qira'at to the Ahruf. This is a topic that 
when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. In the Sahih or the Hassan Hadith of Ubay bin Ka'b, the Hadith of the Ahruf, that when the Prophet mentioned the issue of Ahruf and that there are different Ahruf and whatnot, this is in the version of Muslim Imam Ahmad, Ubay bin Ka'b says, authentic Hadith, فَدَخَلَ فِي نَفْسِي شَكْ In my heart, a doubt came that I hadn't had about Islam since the days of Jahiliyyah. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Quran. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, فَدَخَلَ فِي نَفْسِي شَكْ like, What is all of this stuff? And the Prophet the Prophet, put, it, yeah. put his hand and then he goes, it all went away. Yeah, me and you, yeah. we don't have that blessing. <laughs> all right. Now, there was a bit of mistranslation. He doesn't, it doesn't say he put his hand on his chest. It says that he beat his chest. He hit his chest. But the important detail that I want to get from this hadith is the doubt that this caused. The doubt that this caused Ubay. So, in the other version, it's Omar and Hisham. And this created a confusion and then they learned that the Quran was revealed in these different ways, these different ahruf, and that they were to recite in the way which was easier for them. And the version that we just heard now with Ubay, this one, it, he details the fact that it caused him great doubt, more doubt than he had than before he was even a Muslim. Now, here is another, yet another version of this same hadith and who does a great job, by the way, putting all these, all these different accounts together is Shadi Nasser in his first book. He details all of these accounts and he gives us the chains and all of these things and he kind of comes up with his own uh, conclusions based off of uh, what we can learn about this particular story. I should, I should have known this before, but Shadi Nasser takes the approach, he asks the question, um, chicken or the egg? What came first, the chicken or the egg? He asks the question, what came first? The Quran being revealed in these different ahruf, these different modes? Or is it the confusion that Muslims had because the Quran was being recited in so many different ways that this hadith, that this tradition just came up after to kind of, you know, give it some justification? And make it look nice. So he's so he's saying, which came first, the Quran being recited in many different ways, and this caused confusion, and then this hadith, uh, this tradition comes to kind of explain away the problem because we know many other hadiths, many other traditions were fabricated for that very same purpose to justify certain doctrines and certain practices, certain beliefs in Islam. That's not disputable. Muslims oftentimes will tell you when you bring them references, this is weak, this is fabricated. And what they mean is that these are accounts that are made up later to justify or to, yeah, justify certain things. So, Shadi Nasr asked the question, is that the case with the seven Ahruf tradition? Is it the case that this was a valid tradition and that's why we have all these different readings and understandings of whatever the Quran? Or is it that this was creating confusion and then the story came after to justify it? So I'm sure you guys can guess which side of the coin I take on that. <laughs> All right, so let's get into this version of the hadith now. This is really going to get us into our topic today about early Muslims, whether they felt that they had the freedom to just substitute words and names and different parts and phrases of the Quran with other things. This is really the the, the kind of the foundational hadith to get us started on this topic. So here's a version of the Ahruf story. Again, it's with Ubay. So it says, the prophet, the false prophet said to Ubay, I was asked to recite the Quran and I was asked in one mode or in two modes. So in one harf 
or in harfain, two harfs. And so one mode or two modes. The angel that accompanied me said, say, in two modes. I said, in two modes. I was asked again, in two or three modes. So uh, he's talking, so the Arabic word being translated there, just so we're on the same page. This is again the story of the Ahruf. They're just translating the word as mode, modes. The matter reached up to seven modes. He then said, each mode is sufficiently health giving. Whether you utter all hearing and all knowing instead of, or instead, all powerful and all wise. Now this, this is not really well explained. This is not really well explained. What this is saying, what this is saying is that when you are saying the names of Allah, for example, two of the names of Allah, like, you know, the names of Allah that are paired together here, all hearing and all knowing. It's saying that you can, you can say all hearing and all knowing instead, or you can say all powerful and all wise. All powerful and all wise, all hearing, all knowing. So you can kind of you can just substitute between those two. But then there's a rule. There's a rule. This is valid until you finish the verse. And so what so this so you, this this practice is valid until you finish the verse indicating punishment on mercy. And finish the verse indicating mercy on punishment. So in other words, what this is saying, what this is saying is that you can substitute these names of God for each other. So instead of saying all knowing, all hearing, all hearing, all knowing, you can say all powerful and all wise. The only time you can't do this is when is when there's mercy, when there's mercy, you can't substitute that for um, for punishment or for torment. So if the verse says something about torment, you can't substitute it with something like mercy. So you need to have you can't contradict the meaning. You, you have flexibility. You have flexibility. So if the verse says he's all hearing, well then you can say he's all powerful. But if it's if it's if the verse is talking about Allah's mercy, then you can't substitute that with something that says um, Allah is going to torment or Allah is going to punish because those meanings contradict each other. So you can't substitute in those instances. But what this is saying, what this is giving justification for, is saying that you can substitute these names. Now let's continue on. We have other instances, and again, here is the reference. Here is the reference here for those who want the Arabic references. Uh, we have it in at tabari here. And this is another, yet another account of this hadith. This is another account of this hadith. So, so the first one was with Omar and Hisham. The second one was with Ubay from Yasir Qadi narrated that for us. And then the other one that we just read is from... Uh, from Sunan Abu Dawood, and you guys can see the grading Sahih Al Albani. So none of these are weak or anything like that. No one can can claim that. Uh, and and so then we read that one with Dubai. And do you know you notice the detail? The details. The detail. This is the important detail that we get from this one that you can substitute names as long as they don't contradict. You can substitute names as long as they don't contradict. So if it says mercy you can't substitute and say punishment if it says punishment or torment you can't say mercy right so you have flexibility to to do that now here is again a tabari's version of this hadith or, or at least a version that's recorded by a tabari and um francois de roche he he translate this for us here this is um this is his translation so arabic english this is francois de roche's translation and he says uh, this is this is the um, Al-Tabari version. Okay. One man recited before Omar in a different manner. Omar said, I have recited before the Prophet, false prophet, and his reading was not different from mine. He, the narrator, this, this is, the, this is um, you know, not in the Arabic. This is like, who's saying this? Like, so it says, he said, the two of them disputed with each other in the presence of the false prophet. Uh, so this is like the this is the guy the person narrating the story is saying so Omar and this other guy which in the other version it's Omar and Hisham but this doesn't say it's Hisham so we'll just say the other person they were disputing with each other in the presence of Muhammad Omar said O Messenger of Allah did you not teach me such and such a verse the Prophet false prophet false messenger replied why yes of course and Omar began to have doubts 
So notice how the details are merging together now. The stories, the accounts, they're merging together. So before it was Ubay that was having doubts, now it's Omar who's having doubts. The Prophet, false Prophet, seeing that look on Omar's face, began to beat his breast. And if that's not clear, Muhammad's not beating his own breast. Muhammad is beating Omar's breast. Just like in the account where he, he hits Ubay in the chest, now he's hitting Omar in the chest. And three times Muhammad cried out, three times, go away devil, go away devil, go away devil. He said that three times. And, he, and, he, and then he declared, O oh Omar, all of the Qur'an is, is correct so long as you do not substitute mercy for punishment or punishment for mercy. Again, Arabic, for those who read Arabic, screenshot this. Uh, I'll give you guys the link, those of you guys who want the Arabic. Um, you know, there it is. Here is the translation by François de Roche. And you get the same details from this as you get from the other ones all combined now. But you have the emphasis here is again that the Quran is the same. So in other words, yes, it's different, but it's all the same. It's all correct as long as you don't substitute mercy for punishment or punishment for mercy. So in other words, you can substitute different titles of Allah in the Quran, all wise for all powerful. You can you can just change them. So Muslims who claim Muslims who claim that the you know the early Muslims were learning the Quran word for word from Muhammad, that's clearly not what's going on in these accounts of the early Muslims. The, the, they weren't they weren't learning word for word from Muhammad. They had the freedom to substitute things. They had the freedom to change the words. They had the freedom to change the words of the Quran. And we're going to get into clearer and clearer examples of this. But as long as you don't substitute, so when the Quran says something about mercy, you can't substitute it for something about punishment. When the Quran says something about punishment, you can't substitute it for something about mercy. Okay? So as long as the meanings don't contradict, you can have that flexibility, that liberty to say whatever word you want to say. Okay, so moving on now, we have another comment here from... Um, Francois de Roche, and he says, the reader is instructed not to, su so this is his kind of summary, his, um, his summary of what's going on here. Uh, for those of you who don't know Francois de Roche, he's a very highly respected scholar in this field of uh, Quran, Arabic, history, manuscripts. He, he's highly respected. He's, he's considered one of the world's experts on this topic. So, here is his comments for whatever that's, whatever, whatever that's worth. Here are his comments. He says, The reader is instructed not to substitute mercy where punishment is meant, or punishment for mercy. The formulation is ellipt um, ell elliptical. Sorry, <laughs> got tongue tied. The formulation is elliptical. But the basic idea that it was permissible to make synonymous substitutions. Now, I don't agree that these are all necessarily synonymous, but this is what Francois de Roche is saying. He's he's kind of being a little nice, I would say. He's he's showing some some mercy to the Muslims. But okay, fine. Let's go with what he says here. That is permissible to make that is permissible to make um, synonymous substitutions is readily grasped. In other words, variants of this kind were not prohibited in principle, but not all were acceptable. In the first decades of Islam, then the principle of recitation according to meaning, or this is what Shabir Ali was talking about earlier, that when you're reciting the Quran or reading the Quran according to the sense or according to the meaning, enjoyed a certain legitimacy. Eventually, and when exactly it is hard, it, it, sorry, when exactly it is impossible to say, so when this happened, it's impossible to say, it was supplemented by recitation according to the letter of the text. So this this is this is the later thing that Muslims imposed. The idea that the Quran is to be recited by the letter, by the word of the text, word for word, letter for letter. This is something that came later. And he's saying it's impossible to say when this happened, but it's later. The earlier Muslims recited according to meaning, according to understanding, not necessarily according to a literal word for word dictation, syllable for syllable, sound for sound. Now he goes on and it says it was supplemented by um, by recitation according to the letter of the text, 
the only kind recognized by Muslim orthodoxy today. Okay, so this is the type that is accepted and recognized by Muslim orthodoxy today. We know that. This is what Muslims today say. So let's go a bit further. Here is another reference. Here we have, uh, okay, so we have um, uh, Ibn Jinni. He's giving us an account here. Again, I want to give the people who speak Arabic an opportunity to screenshot or to, you know, whatever you want to do, read this, pause this, read this. We have another account um, that we're going to cover. Again, this is by Ibn Jinni, and he tells us um, the account here. So those of you guys who speak Arabic, you guys read Arabic, you understand Arabic, screenshot, pause, do what you want to do. Or for those of you guys who have Muslim friends who always say, hey, give me the Arabic, you need to get an Arabic, you guys screenshot this too, and you guys take the references as well. Because, you know, maybe it is a good idea to give them the sources in Arabic, that's fine. Now... So here is the summarization of those sources. Here's a summarization of those sources. This is uh, what both of these sources are talking about. So we're focusing on these parts with to do with one of the companions of Muhammad, Anas. And he, uh, he uh, said a, a couple of really interesting things here that we're going to get into right now. I just want to show the people who speak Arabic the references exactly where to, where to look. Okay, so this is Francois de Roche's um, summary of what is going on in those texts. Okay, he, go, he says, Various reports seem to indicate that in the 7th century, the companions felt that it was acceptable to use synonyms during the recitation of a Quranic passage. That is, to replace one word by another while respecting its meaning. Guys, this is this is exactly what these texts are saying. The Arabic text, he's giving us the summi summarization or the translation or you could say the explanation rather of what these texts are saying. The conception of recitation according to sense or you can translate um, ma'ana as uh, according to meaning. Uh, he does by sense, but that's fine. Meaning or sense was opposed to the other one. So this, this conception of recitation according to meaning, according to sense, was opposed to the other one, which insisted on the need to respect the very letter of the text, and he gives you the Arabic here, in which in the end prevailed. Okay? So in the end, that's what won out in Muslim orthodoxy, what came, must became Muslim orthodoxy. But we're not concerned with what became Muslim orthodoxy. You guys know all the streams that we've done on the Qira'at and the history of that with Ibn Mujahid all the way through history, Ibn Jazuri, all of these guys, you guys know that we've done it on this channel and on DCCI Ministries and many other channels cover this as well. But that's not our focus today. Our focus is on the early Muslims, not the Qira'at, not, 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 not the um, Qira'at or, or anything that comes later. We're talking about the early Muslims and what they believed was proper Pronunci uh, sorry, preservation of the Quran. So then he gives the, the examples here that I was just showing in Arabic. He says, thus, for example, in the case of Quran 73, verse 6, one companion, Anas bin Malik, between 709 and 711, accepted both. And then he gives you the Arabic here and the translation. Um, so, so he's giving you uh, the two ways that Anas would recite this verse. Okay? And... What what so one way means it's more correct and the other way means it's more righteous according to his translations. So sometimes so Ennis would say the the verse um, the t today it's written in the Quran more correct or more straight you could say and then you know he's saying that you know it would be more righteous or whatever uh, or you could say you know these are more or less um, synonymous with each other but he's saying that uh, you know these are the two ways that Ennis would recite the verse. And then someone objected to him. Someone objected to Ennis. Someone objected to Ennis. Uh, where are we going here? Sorry, guys. I think I just... Oh, sorry. I zoomed in. That's what happened. <laughs> I was tearing myself off there. Okay. Uh, so someone objected to Ennis and they said to him, like, basically, you said it like this, but it's supposed to be like this. And then he responded by saying, oh, they're both the same. They're both one. So in other words, Ennis wasn't concerned with the exact preservation of the letters of how 
this guy thought Muhammad said it. He's like, no, you can say it like this or you can say it like that. They're both the same. Okay? And then um, there's another one where uh, there's another instance where uh, he gives us uh, three different instances. So that so for chapter 73, verse 6, he gives us two ways to, to recite the verse. And he says, you know, they're both the same. Because someone asked him, no, it's not. You know, you recite it like that. You recite it like this. And then he goes on and says, no, they're both the same. So in chapter 9, verse 57, it's saying that Ennis replaced the word um, Yajmahun. And he instead of saying Yajmahun, he said Yajmizun. Yajmizun. And, and then he said, uh, you know, whether you say Yajmahun, Yajmizun, Yajtadun, they all mean the same thing. <laughs> So he, so he's, so by the way, these words don't all mean the same thing. Yajmahun um, uh, um, means uh, like running very fast, like you're sprinting, running very fast, which is very similar meaning to Yajtahun, uh, Yajtahadun. Uh, um, uh, so that's like, they're like very similar in meaning, but Yajmahun, uh, Yajmizun, sorry, I'm reading the English. <laughs> I should go back to the... Uh, Sometimes it's, it's difficult to read the transliteration. So Yajmahun is one word that means running very fast or sprinting. Um, um, Yajmizun means, uh, you know, walking slowly or like, like, a, like strolling or like at a, at a you know, um, like kind of like a, at a slower pace. And these have a very, uh, and so, so then, so the first word and the third word, um, um, yashtadun, this has a, a meaning very similar to each other where it comes to like walking fast, uh, as well, or running, sorry, running fast. And so we have, we have, uh, dictionaries here, um, for those of you guys who speak Arabic, you guys can see, um, we're talking here about, um, uh, running fast or sprinting. And, you know, we have a couple different here. You have another example here in the dictionary. Uh, and then uh, this means walking slowly or, you know, like strolling or going kind of slow when you're walking. Um, and then this means very similar to the first word, means running fast. The point is, the point is that uh, they, they don't mean exactly the same thing. Okay, that, that's the point. They don't mean exactly the same thing. Um, so, so he had the freedom he felt he had the liberty to say any one of these three when he's reciting chapter 9, verse uh, 57. He could recite it with this word, with this word, or with this word. And he says they all mean the same thing. They don't all mean the same thing. Maybe like this word and this word mean very similar things, but this word means something a little different. Running fast versus walking uh, slowly or something like that. So, the, so that's not really our focus about what the words exactly mean. The point is... Which one did Muhammad say? Which one's written on the preserved tablet? Right? Which one's written on the preserved tablet? Is it this one? Is it Yajmahun? Is, is it, which word is on the preserved tablet? Which one did the um, supposed angel come and say to Muhammad? Which one? Ennis didn't really care about that. He said you could say it this way, this way, or that way. Okay. So now we're going to uh, go on to another point here that this really emphasizes the point. You guys will see that this really is, is a strong emphasis on this point about how the early Muslims, how the early Muslims saw uh, this topic about preservation. Do they want to go word for word or is it about meaning or whatever? So here we have another companion of Muhammad. Um, Abu al-Darda, uh, he, he said that he was teaching a man, al-Darda, was teaching a man to read uh, read the Qur'an. And so I'll just, um, here it is, the tree of um, Zakum. Zakum is like, supposedly it's like this tree that's in, like it's in like the hell in Islam. Like there's like this tree of, of hell or something. It's like somewhere in hell. Uh, you know, Muslims, they differ on like all this stuff. So it's, that's one of the explanations at least. So, it says that the tree of Zakum is the food of the sinner. So, so here's an instance where you have a companion teaching someone the tree of um, Zakum is the food of the sinner. But the man, again and again, and here's the Arabic above it. He, he you know, he kept re he kept trying to recite the verse, but every time he would, you know, get to the last word, instead of saying sinner, he would say orphan. So. So instead of saying that the, that the 
that the tree here is the food of the sinner, he would say that the tree is the food of the orphan. And then he says that, you know, this particular companion saw that he didn't understand. So this man didn't understand, like he couldn't differentiate or he didn't understand or something was going on there where he's like, he keeps saying orphan, but I'm saying sinner. He keeps saying orphan, but I'm saying sinner. And then you guys can see in the Arabic, uh, you know, he, he doesn't understand. And so then he teaches them a new way, a new way. Um, but the Arabic is right above it for those guys who, those of you guys who want to screenshot the Arabic or whatever you want to do with the Arabic. And so how does he teach it to him? He teaches it to him that the, the tree of Zakum is the food of the wicked. So he completely changes the word. He completely changes the word. Instead of, instead of uh, giving him the proper pronunciation or whatever, or giving him the proper uh, reading of the verse, he just changes it up altogether. So here's the situation, guys. You have a companion of Muhammad who's teaching this particular verse. Actually, it's two verses in the Quran, chapter 44, verses 43 to 44. And he's teaching him, uh, like, you know, how to recite this verse. But the guy who he's teaching didn't understand or he, there was something going on there where he couldn't he couldn't differentiate or he didn't understand the difference between a sinner and an orphan so he so then then this companion he he, he just he just came to this realization okay what i need to do is i just need to teach him a new word altogether so instead of saying sinner or orphan he just taught him to say the wicked in other words He's not concerned with saying, this is how it's like, he's not, it doesn't, we don't get the impression that he's so concerned with saying, this is how exactly how I learned it from Muhammad. So I have to make sure he says the word sinner. He has to say the word sinner. He has to say the word sinner. He keeps saying orphan. Instead of saying that, he's like, okay, <laughs> I'm just going to teach him a whole new word altogether. So now it's not sinner. Now it's not orphan. It's just going to be the wicked. So it's, it's a completely different word. And then we have this uh, reference. Uh, this is in Atabri. It's in a couple different places in Atabri, but you guys can see that he, he um, in the Arabic at least, he's giving him a command. He's commanding him, say it like this. So he's focusing on, uh, you know, he, he's commanding him how to say the Quran. I think we have another reference of it here. Um, yeah, okay. So he again, he's, he's commanding him, say it like this. In other words, he's teaching him He's teaching him the Quran the way that he probably learned it. But the guy kept saying orphan instead of saying the sinner. So the, so the food of the orphan, the food of the sinner. He's like, okay, this guy's not getting it. So I'm just going to have him say the food of the wicked. And so he's commanding him, say it like this. All right. I think that we can conclude with saying that the early Muslims were not concerned with preserving the Quran word for word, exactly how they learned it from Muhammad. And I'm sure that there's other application that you guys can think of in using this material in, in your ministry to Muslims, or if you're a Muslim, I hope that this is enough to show you that you were lied to from your sheikhs, from your leaders, that the standard narrative has holes, as Yasir Qadi is famous for saying. All right, so I guess uh, we can just kind of wrap up there. That's the information that I want to get out there. I was learning about this and I always get excited when I learn new information because this, I believe, is going to be used as a tool, I pray, an effective tool that the Lord uses to shake Muslims up and to get them to see that they can't trust in the Islamic narrative, they can't trust in Muhammad, they can't trust in Islam. They have to trust in Jesus. They have to repent and trust in Jesus. So um, I'm going to end with a kind of a funny clip here. But before I do, I want to say God bless you all and thank you for watching. Hopefully this was beneficial and uh, useful to you guys. Um, God bless everybody. We're going to end with this clip here. Prophet said it like this and he said it like that. Allah said it like this and he said it like that. Because they keep asking the question, so which one is in the preserved tablet? What's the answer to that question? The preserved tablet is that of the unseen yeah. and we will not be given access to that. Yeah. So which one is in the preserved tablet? What's the answer to that question? 
the preserved tablet is that of the unseen yeah. and we will not be given access to that. Yeah. So which one is in the preserved tablet? What's the answer to that question? The preserved tablet is that of the unseen yeah. and we will not be given access to that.